my sidekick Dobby and it's been a little while since my last video but I am back and today I am here to talk about War Storm by Victoria Aveyard. War Storm is the fourth book in the Red Queen series which is lined up right behind me. They are some of the prettiest books I have. If you know the story at all, you might be able to tell why I am wearing what I am wearing. I have a combination of a red dress and some specifically silver jewelry. And I will get more into that specifically in a moment. If you don't know, Red Queen is about a girl named Mare who finds herself working at the palace after some events and she lives in a world where there are silver bloods and red bloods. And if you have silver blood, it means you have these magical powers that give you the ability to do some special amazing thing. And the red bloods are just like normal humans. And because of their powers, the silver bloods have taken over and see themselves as superior to the red bloods. But Mare finds out that even though she is indeed red-blooded, she has some power of her own. And it sets her on a big adventure with princes and twists and turns and backstabbing, and it's amazing. If you have not picked up this book yet, please do. I think that is pretty much it for my non-spoiler at all section. I do not have any videos for the first two books in the series because I read them before I started doing my videos. I do have a video for King's Cage, which is the third book in the series, which I will link below and have a card up for. So if you have read at least the first two, probably the first three, you can check that out. And once you have read the fourth one, come back and continue watching here. I am going to get into my somewhat spoiler section. So if you have not read the first three books in the series, now is your time to go away. Don't forget to subscribe and follow me on Twitter at ReaderGonnaRead. And I will just talk about the first three books in a moment. Yeah? Okay. Bye! Okay, so if you're still here, hopefully that means you've read at least the first three books in this series. In my video for King's Cage, I talked about how much the ending of the second book destroyed me which it did, and how the ending of the third one also destroyed me, but in a very different way, which it did. So, we left King's Cage with Cal accepting his possible fate as king, and Mare declaring that she never wants to be queen, and therefore they had to just go their separate ways. I hated it. It hurt so much. But I was like, okay, obviously they're going to end up together. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, let's do this last book. I'll get more into that later. Heading into this book, I knew they were going to be starting apart. And I knew that all I wanted was for the two of them to end up together. And for Maven to die. Obviously. Sorry. Okay, apparently I can't really do a just part spoiler section. So I'm just going to say that this book starts off pretty close to where that one ended. Yeah, I think there's only like an hour difference between the ending of the third one and the start of the fourth one. So we're still in the aftermath of that conversation between Cal and Mare. And the book follows mostly Mare, Evangeline, and um, Maven's new wife. Those are the three people it mostly follows with a little bit of Cal and Maven thrown in as well which makes it interesting. But those are three very different perspectives, which I really enjoyed hearing throughout it, because they all have completely different takes about the things that they all see, and they're all often seeing different things at different times. And I will get much more into that in my spoiler section. So I think I'm going to give my official spoiler warning. Oh, I will say, I gave this book four stars on Goodreads, it is lower than my rating of King's Cage. I didn't like it as much, and I will explain why 
in my spoiler section. So I'm going to give my official spoiler warning. If you have not yet read War Storm, go away. Please subscribe. Come back once you have. Okay? Okay, bye. If you're still here, hopefully that means you have read War Storm and are ready to talk about it. So, some overall thoughts before I get into it. I did like this book. It only took me about four days to read, which is a good sign because this book was kind of a monster in terms of size. I was a little underwhelmed by the ending, and I'll get into more specifics about that when I get into it. I did take notes as I was reading, so I will be using my cell phone to remind me of some of my thoughts. I do remember I started out just talking a lot about Mare and Cal and how much it hurt that they weren't together and how I still didn't quite understand what the deal was. Like, why couldn't they just choose something that was good for everybody and have them flat out say, like, we want a combination of red and silver. They look good together. To be in charge. Like, what was the problem? I don't understand. Anyway, I will say the first Iris, that's her name, the first Iris chapter, I kind of struggled to get through. It was a really long chapter. I didn't really care that much about her. And I was just like, why am I reading? about you right now. I don't care. I just want Cal and Bear together. Why is that so difficult? I was kind of just over it. So around page 100, I started to really like the interactions between Davidson and Evangeline, who I think Evangeline had the best storyline in this book. I adored her in this book, which re-watching my King's Cage video, I realized that I said in that one that I liked her, or I at least respected her, a lot more than I had in the previous books, but in this one I started to absolutely adore her. I love her. A lot. But I'll get more into that later. But yeah, so her and Davidson, I was like, okay, so I'm liking them. I'm thinking since they both like want to take over in some way, I could see them sitting on like a council together. I kind of forgot at the time that Davidson had his own country to run. I saw some sort of like friendly relationship going on there. I have a note, pages 103 to 104, best conversation ever. That's the one where Davidson is talking to Evangeline and is just like, in our country, men can be in relationships with men and it's respected. What about yours? And I'm just like, oh snap he is basically calling her out on living a lie and showing that it doesn't have to be a lie and it was amazing and i loved that little part of the book so much anyway shortly after that they're at dinner at davidson's place and they're all taking their places and cal goes and sits right next to mare and everybody's just watching this and I was flipping out at this point. I'm like, just like, get back together. Like, I don't understand. You both are clearly in love with each other. I do get the whole, we want different things in our lives, but like, no, just, you want each other. That's what matters. It hurts so much to sit there and watch them fight their feelings. Then, the raiders come, and we get through that, and it's just like, okay, and then you find out Maven sent them. Maven sent the raiders. I guess that makes sense, because, like, otherwise it would be pretty random to the story. Oh, I have a note here. Maven's wife, number one, Evangeline, a.k.a. Cal's betrothed, and Mare, the girl they both love, are all hoping that both of the brothers fall from power. Interesting. All of the women that they have any sort of relationship with are rooting for their failure. I love this book. <laughs> when they were trying to get the support from Davidson's country, and they were like, but why would we support a red taking power again? I'm like, wouldn't it be so much easier for him to be like, you know what, you shouldn't. You should support me and Mare working together, and I know that she doesn't want it, but it's okay, we'll convince her that it's what's best for 
everybody, and everything will be great. Why is that so difficult? Why couldn't they just do that? I have another note. This is torture. Just be together. They were torturing themselves. It's not okay. We got halfway through the book, and I'm like, they're still not together. I was expecting that to happen way earlier. Oh, so Maven is doing all of this, like, behind-the-scenes stuff and being so freaking smart, and I was literally just like, was he this smart in the other books? I guess he was. I mean, he did manipulate everybody, but I don't know. I always just thought of him as, like, evil and tricky in that people underestimated him, which I guess is still the case here, but he was, like, actually pulling a lot of strings and being really smart, and it threw me off. Like, he was always a step ahead in this book, until he wasn't. But for most of it, he was a step ahead. He just put too much trust in his treaty with his wife. Oops. I have two no notes in a row here that I need to read out. It was when they were fighting and she came just in time to see Cal almost die. And I was like, he just almost died. You don't have room to pretend you don't have feelings. Get over yourself and run to him. Oh! And then right after that, it is about stinking time. So yeah, apparently it takes him, I think he literally like died for a second and came back for her to be like, okay, I kind of need to give into my feelings for a little bit. And then the way they kept just being like, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't change anything. We made our choices. I'm like, it does change everything. I mean, no, it doesn't because it was always going to happen this way. Except, <sighs> we'll get back into that. But, like, yeah, it obviously it changes things. You love each other. You're giving into it. You're realizing that you can't live in a world where the other one doesn't exist. That means you can't live without each other. Just, why is it so difficult? Just be together. And I, I know, but I know. Ugh. Oh, I also liked that they're finally together and having that, like, it doesn't change anything conversation. And then the book switches to Maven's head for the first time right after that. I got a kick out of that. Good for you, Victoria Aviard. That was amazing. <laughs> oh, at one point, I was like, hmm, Evangeline caught on to the fact that if her father dies, all of her problems disappear. She can be with who she wants to be with. She doesn't have to be forced onto the throne. And with Cal, everything's okay, and there's already a plan to have her father killed. So maybe just let it happen, which she ended up doing, which is kind of terrible. But for the sake of a fictional book, it was good. <laughs> then there's the point where they've won over the place, and it's the moment that probably hurt more than anything else, where the Reds are like, we have done what we needed to do with you. If you really would like to put another Red on the throne, this is where our allyship ends, and we will depart. Cal actually had a good Point, that the country would completely fall apart if he just immediately abdicated. It would need to be a slow process, which is true, but apparently that wasn't good enough for Davidson and them, and Mare went with them, which I was not happy about, although she did need to see her family again. I also just have a note that was like, they took Maven? Why did they take Maven? They just like walks in and grabs Maven and is like, he's coming with us! And then Mare is stuck with this guy that she absolutely despises, to continue on, and then he freaking escapes! Temporarily. Oh my god! Now we're getting into the areas where I thought I saw these like awesome twists and turns coming, and they ended up not being those awesome twists and turns. The first one was when Evangeline and Cal had like a heart-to-heart -heart in the room, and Evangeline told Cal about her father. I thought from the way the conversation was going, that they were about to cook up some awesome scheme that I was going to love that would end up with, like, Mare and Cal being able to be together again and the country being a better place and Evangeline getting to go and be with her love and it was all just, like, nothing. It was just, like, that was the end of the conversation and then they were on their own again. And I'm like, what was the point of that? Then we find out that John put this whole thing in play by pushing the mentor off the ladder and killing him, apparently. I guess he never confirmed that that's what happened, but it sure seems like that was the case. So he basically 
started a war. I mean, I guess it was to make the world a better place, and he claims that he saw a whole bunch of versions and that was the best one, but he still murdered somebody and caused the death of others, which is not okay. Oh, I need to talk about Julian for a second. He got much darker in this book because he was always the one with like the good advice, the mentor figure, he was awesome. And then in this one, he's like murdering people for Cal. I was not a fan of that, but we do get to see him be awesome again at one point. So that's good. I have a note like, oh good, I was starting to think I couldn't trust him. At one point I thought there was going to be a huge twist where, what's his name, the white lightning guy was Thomas and he hadn't really died, but again, that didn't happen. Megan gets away and is off on his own, but they're coming to help Cal because they can't let the Lakelanders destroy, and they come and Cal asks Mare if it's too late. She's like, no, of course it's not too late. And then they go and they kiss and they're together, and everything is wonderful for about two minutes. Then it all goes to crap. Because Mare needs to go after Maven. And then Maven has to be a jerk and force her to kill him. It was self-defense. But she still feels incredibly guilty to the point that she feels like she can't be with Cal because she killed Maven because he forced her to. I'm not okay with this at all. Now I'm getting into my issues with the ending. First of all, I have an issue with the fact that Cal and Mare did not end up together officially. Okay, so I'm somebody that typically likes open endings for the most part, but this one was too open. Like for one thing, Cal and Mare aren't together right now and she's like, I will go back, like trying to convince herself. And we don't know if that's true or not. We hope it is. We assume it is. I don't know. She's so stubborn. <laughs> Cal is like, I can still be with you. I love you. I understand that it was self-defense. And she's like, no, I can't be with you after I killed your brother, who you still kind of had hope for. But no, he didn't. He had lost his hope. They had had that meeting, and he saw that there was no way the brother he thought existed was coming back, and he had accepted that. He had accepted that his brother needed to die. I don't know who should have been the one to kill him, because it shouldn't have been Mare, and I don't think it should have been Cal, although that probably would have been better of the two. But he needed to die. He needed to. There was no redemption for him. That was it. Although I was kind of hoping, because there was no redemption for him himself, but I was kind of hoping that as he was dying, first of all, it would be both Mare and Cal there as he's dying. And he would kind of look at them and notice that they were back together and look at Cal and be like, you're giving up the throne? And Cal says yes. And he would say like, good for you. Or something. So like, not redeeming himself, but like noticing redemption in somebody else and recognizing somebody else's positive growth in a way. That's how I would have done it. <laughs> but that's not what happened. Instead, he was evil till the end and forced Mare's hand, which ended up throwing a wrench between her and Cal, which was probably his plan all along because he is totally evil and is totally the if I can't have you, neither can my brother type of person. First unclear thing, we don't know what's going on there. Second unclear thing, which is probably worse in the grand scheme of things, we never find out what is happening with the government in the country. We know that Cal is helping to rebuild it and change it, but we don't know if it's like a president situation or a council situation or a senate situation. There's no information there. We just know it's going to be different. I don't know what that means. I would like to know what that means. I don't know what that means. That's two. Number three is the fact that they leave it with the Lakelanders as well, they can't win right now, so they're going to leave, but they'll probably be back at some point. This is the last book in the series. You can't leave it that open. I assume she's leaving it open to, like, some sort of novella or something to round it out, but no, I want that to be extra. Like, I'm happy to read something extra, but it shouldn't be this necessary to a story. And again, I like open endings, but not where you can't even guess what's going to happen, because... 
there's so much left to still happen and end and explain. And it seems like Killorn is going to be happy, but like he might be the only one? I don't know. I need to talk. So Evangeline, as I said, she was probably my favorite character in this book because her growth was amazing. She goes from, in the previous books, just caring about the crown and finally getting it only to realize that it's not that simple to realizing that, you know what? It's not worth it. And it's more important to be with the person that you love and be happy than to have a crown on your head. So I love her development, I love her story, and I was so happy to see her become such a stronger person than she started out in the first book. And I love the girl power in this series because Cal and Maven are largely the ones that are more like driven by love and desire, which is typically more of a female trait, and girls are more thoughtful and level-headed, which is great. Anyway, I think that might be it. Like I said, I did give this one four stars. It's not my least favorite in the series, and it's definitely not my most favorite in the series. I'm not sure which one I liked more between Red Queen and this one, but King's Cage is definitely my number one, and Glass Sword is definitely my number four. So do with that as you will. If she writes another novella, I will read it, but I will be kind of mad that it wasn't in the actual book. Sorry. Anyway, that is it. I will talk to you next time. Please follow me on Twitter at ReaderGonnaRead, just like my YouTube channel. Give me a thumbs up if you like this video, and subscribe by clicking down below or up there. I will talk to you next time. Bye! Hey, Ellie and Dobby here. Like the video? Come subscribe. Do it right now. Click it.